shelves on your grocery stores, weeks and weeks of backlog to order simple products online. According to the Biden administration, give up your white privilege. Quit complaining about it, man. It could be a lot worse, right? This isn't the 1970s yet. I'm Dr. Duke, and this is The Dr. Duke Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Dr. Duke Show, the only program that keeps you educated on the craziness compacting K-12 classrooms and college campuses around the world. But before we start, if you're watching us on social media, please just do a big favor. Just hit share, the share button, to keep more and more people informed. Today, Katie is kicking things off with a look at the health of our republic. You know the tale, the tale of a ship lost at sea. But for us, it's not so much lost, but really it's the cargo ships just bobbing out there, sitting in the queue, waiting to be allowed in and unloaded. Thankfully, Joe Biden is so successful at his job that Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg just has to go out there and lie about everything. Look, uh, part of what's happening isn't just the supply side, it's the demand side. Demand is off the charts. Retail sales are through the roof. And if you think about those images of uh, ships, for example, waiting at anchor on the West Coast, you know, every one of those ships uh, is full of record amounts of goods that Americans are buying uh, because demand is up, because income is up, uh, because the president has successfully guided this economy out of the teeth of a terrifying recession. We'll address those lies moving forward, but just know that he is taking credit for all the goodness happening, which is awkward, but not as awkward as the fact that Buttigieg has been on paternity leave for one month, two months, who knows, because he was gone and nobody seemed to notice. He and his husband adopted twins at the same time the ships stalled out. While he was gone using bottles, the supply chains were bottlenecking, and all of America has a collective poopy diaper and subsequent rash. Now, look, even though I've been on paternity leave and I'm proud of it, uh, obviously given the nature of my job, when you take a job like mine, you understand and accept that you're gonna have to be available 24-7, uh, depending on what's going on, and you're gonna have to engage, and I did. Wrong. He's been gone doing nothing about this crisis, and he's proud of it. Which brings us to today's question. How have you been impacted by the supply chain issues? Make sure to comment below and then share this video, because at least then it will be able to get to the person it's intended for. We don't need any bottlenecking here. Back to PDB. The first thing Buttigieg did when he came back, seemingly this week, was get in front of the camera with his friendly media compadres. Secretary Buttigieg, welcome back to Meet the Press. Thanks for having me back. He's a little rusty. Just give him a moment to get into the lying groove. Your Secretary of Transportation, the ports, all of this is uh, under your purview here. Uh, the big news you made was trying to establish a 24-7 operation now uh, at as many of our nation's ports as possible. Well, let me ask you, this supply chain issue has been a problem for months why wait till this week to try that? Ooh, 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 call on me. I know, I know. Why weren't we at a 24-7 operation nine months ago, 10 months ago, a year ago? Well, uh, I can't speak to a year ago before this administration was in office, but what I can tell you is that uh, as soon as the president came in, he issued an executive order to, I think in February, to look at the supply chain from all angles. Of course, it's Trump's fault. And I'm sure it's capitalism's fault and the fact that big government isn't allowed to take over. But let's remember, these are private sector systems. This is a capitalist country. Nobody wants the federal government to own or operate the stores, the warehouses, right. the trucks, or the ships or the ports. Our role is to try to make sure we're supporting those businesses and those workers who do. Buttigieg has been gone for a few months, so he's missed what his boss is being told to do. Take over every aspect of everything and screw everyone with their pants on. That's why Buttigieg can say that first lie I showed you. Let's refresh your memory. You know, every one of those ships uh, is full of record amounts of goods that Americans are buying uh, because demand is up, because income is up, uh, because the president has successfully guided this economy out of the teeth of a terrifying recession. I'm sure you just had the same reaction I did. Oh, come on! It was also the reaction when I saw this clip from Biden still trying to make the $3.5 trillion Build Back Better plan a thing. These bills, in my view, are literally about competitiveness versus complacency, about opportunity versus decay, and about leading the world 
or continue to let the world move by us. Folks, a lot of folks know what's at stake in the infrastructure bill. It's about rebuilding the arteries of our economy, putting people to work in good paying jobs. The estimates from Wall Street would create up to 16 million new jobs over time. Good paying jobs, union jobs. Not, not, not five bucks an hour, seven, 15, but 40, 50 dollars an hour, you know, prevailing wage. It has not been those five buck an hour jobs for 25 years, but only us non-lifetime politicians would actually know that. We're the ones who have ever actually seen those numbers. Right, Joe? I don't think we should punish anybody, but just pay your fair share. It's poetic that Biden is standing in front of a bookshelf that has the books Hungry Hungry Caterpillar and Little Blue Truck Leads the Way. And there's a Dr. Seuss book, that racist, racist man, according to Biden's favorite progressives. If you have kids, you know those books and you can see the irony of what Biden is preaching. Never mind that inflation rose yet again to 5.4%, which is only 4% more than when Biden came into office. In August, a record 4.3 million people quit their jobs. Some because of the jab mandates, some because you can have your pick at jobs since so many people aren't working, which was caused by the following reason of why work when the government teat is flowing. What was also flowing was money out of my pocketbook as gas prices just keep on rising, but only if there is actual gasoline available, which is apparently not a given. You just saw all of that. It's so very clear that it's all Donald Trump's fault. But hey, the economy is going stellar thanks to Joe Biden. Am I doing that right? Please, please let me know if I'm not doing that right. And yes, that last slide was my very own photo from my local gas station. And yes, I do in fact drive one of those uber flashy and luxurious vehicles, as would be expected. It's, it's one of those things they call a minivan. And you bet it's from 2014. I call her Goldie. But hey, we can't talk about such things. We're just all living here on Biden's island, but not like Epstein's island, but maybe it is. Joe Biden couldn't keep his hands off Carter's wife, Stephanie. Stephanie Carter seemed frozen as Biden's grip seemed to last too long. And Joe, who knows her, leaned forward and whispered some encouragement, telling her that she was doing great, that she looked wonderful. The left, will you who shut up, on, man? Listen, who is on your list, Joe? This Who's is on your so list? right. Gentlemen, is, I think this we've is ended so this unpresidential. Court. Yeah, it is unpresidential. Joe lost his dinghy long ago and has been lost at sea for many years. And uh, what am I doing here? I'm going to lose track here. And now, I think I've exhausted my theme here with Gilligan's Island. Maybe you want something a little bit more upbeat, a little bit more updated. How about this one? And I say it with a passion As I pull off in the Aston Don't nobody like us that time Try to cover up and tell the people go Brandon But we know what they saying though You can hear the chant in every post Don't nobody want this commie cause we not in China Everybody hated Trump and now they out to catch a body that's what they get for treating us like we in square games. Green light mandate, like he's insane. These times people waking up to everything. Go Brandon, but we all know what the saying means. That's Loza Alexander, whose song Let's Go Brandon hit number one on the iTunes hip hop chart, number one on Amazon, and number one basically everywhere. I only wonder why. And he hasn't even released the full record yet, so stay tuned for that. Just thank God, son. Don't forget to thank God. I, I can't thank God enough. That's right. I can't thank him enough. It's like how, it's like how, it's like how, like. Exactly, how. Alexander's lyrics express the regret and frustration of many Americans at the poor performance of the Biden administration. But don't take my word for it. Biden's unpopularity just keeps climbing, or rather his popularity just keeps sinking like a ship, Titanic style. We are now at 52% of Americans disapproving of Biden, while an iceberg 37% approve, according to the latest Quinnipiac University poll. As you can see, people are rightfully abandoning ship. Women and children first, please. And I don't mean those who simply identify as such. I guess I shouldn't use abandoned ship because that's the whole issue. We can't have the products that are stuck on those ships abandon these ships thanks to these supply chain issues. See how it all works? unlike the current transportation secretary. If you could show just a bit of work and share this video, I would very much appreciate it. Until next time, let's go Brandon and stay healthy America.
Joined now by Vicki McKenna for our weekly Culture Cast segment. Vicki, good to see you. Great to see you, Duke. Well, the, uh, I think we can say it's p- political per- correctness, wokeness has escaped culture campus, right? Now, privilege, which yeah. used to be one of those things they talk about at college campuses all the time, now we're hearing it from the White House and defenders of Joe Biden. Bottom line is, is that if you're upset by all of these backdrops, by all of this uh, l- lag in time for getting your stuff out of ships, the, the, the empty shelves that we're about to see all over the stores, it's just your, it's just your privilege, isn't it? Yeah, you check your privilege. Check your privilege. This is what the Washington Post writer Christina uh, Peshaw said. Look, folks, you know, empty store shelves, bacon at $12 a pound, the impossibility of finding a reasonably priced used car, you know, all kinds of issues with you maybe not being able to afford your heating costs this winter. You know what? You just need to pipe down. You need to be a little bit more grateful, you spoiled, rotten, white supremacist, and check your privilege. Because, you know, our ancestors had it bad. This this smacks of, when I was a kid, I used to walk uphill in both directions in a blinding snowstorm. And you kids can ride the bus. It sounds like the stuff your parents used to tell you when you'd whine a little bit about, about something being a little bit hard. Um, so, you know, never mind the food shortages or the basic shortages or the fact your heating fuel is going to explode and cost because you just need to be a little bit more grateful and realize that others had it bad once too. Yeah, you know, I mean, I don't see how you could complain. I get that you're gonna go without necessities and you're gonna have to pay way more than you usually do. But look, Secretary Buttigieg got to spend two weeks with his, two months with his newborn baby. I mean, yes, how, that, now that he obviously gave birth to. Yeah, that's Clearly. not pri- that's not privilege at all, isn't it? You, you, you know, it's not privilege for all of those folks to hop on private jets and fly over to the latest climate summit. No, it's you wanting food at reasonable prices and you wanting to be able to afford to heat your house in the Midwest. You are such an ungrateful Karen. I mean, when is the rest of America, half of America, going to realize that the Biden administration doesn't like Americans? I mean, on top of these sorts of things, you deserve this kind of stuff. We have, especially if you're in the flyover country, you you deserve these kinds of, you need need to learn what it's like to live like the third world countries. But even that, you and I have talked about this before. To me, the single biggest example of privilege is unvaccinated illegal immigrants crossing the border, being mailed, being sent directly to your home on American jets, American planes, and you, however, having to be taking the jab because, you know, as Americans, you just need to learn. Or get fired. Yeah, you know, you got to get fired. You won't be able to go get on planes. You can't do all these things because, you know, you check your privilege and do what's right for the country unless... You are an illegal alien who didn't even have their measles shots, let alone their vaccinations for COVID, and you get bust or flown right into your backyard. Oh, you get all sorts. You get an array of privileges. You get an array of accolades, as long as you're not a citizen of the United States. And if you're from Afghanistan, for heaven's sakes, what we're going to do is not actually have Americans protected. We're going to fly you in exactly the same thing. We'll make sure you get everything you need. And then when you gripe about it, we're not going to say, hey, you can always go to Pakistan and put you on a plane and send you home. No, 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 no. We will. We are going to fundamentally alter our culture. Never demand that people who are in this country illegally uh, or people who are not citizens of the United States ever assimilate for our to our culture, because of course we're a bunch of bleeding, uh, spoiled, rotten, privileged white supremacists. No, 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 no. We're going to treat you as if you are gold. By the way, going back to the elites. You, you, you think about this unbelievable elitism and this unbelievable um, you know, disconnect with the reality of what average American experiences. Um, I would just like to see a couple of things that I don't think I'm asking for a lot. Number one, I want all the Haitians, I want all the Afghanis, I want all of the folks who are in here from the third world with no education, seeking social service benefits and handouts I want them to live in Marin County. I want them to live on the Gold Coast in Chicago. I want them to live in Martha's Vineyard. At the, at the same time, I want all of the folks who live in those, in those special protected enclaves where, where poverty and scarcity never touches them to be forced to live for one week in a, in a, in a medium-sized city in Wisconsin where they have to go to the Target and have absolutely nothing on the store shelves 
while trying to figure out how they're going to fight the big lady in the meat section of the Woodman's to get that last pound of bacon. I want them to have to experience a little bit of the pain that they seem to be blowing off because none of it touches them. It does make you wonder, doesn't it? How many uh, Haitians can you fit in Obama's Martha's Vineyard mansion? It would be an interesting exercise. What do you think, 10,000? Easily. I'm gonna go with 10,000, and that's a good start. But this is just, this is your typical elitist privilege. Um, They do not care that we're miserable. They do not care that we're broke. They do not care that we're unemployed. They do not care that we're being threatened. They do not care that this country is divided. They don't care our military is falling apart. They don't care that China just tested a hypersonic missile uh, and put it into orbit around the globe without anybody even practically realizing it. They don't care about any of that because none of it affects them. And so, you know, you just had Joe Biden come out today and say 28 million kids age 5 to 11 are going to be forced to get the vaccine. You know, the beatings will continue until morale improves. After the break, let's talk about, are there any consequences anymore for the left's elitism? Let's talk about why do they not seem to be afraid of what may be a landslide election against them? Let's talk about that after the break with consequences. Back again with Vicki McKenna for CultureCast. Vicki, let's talk about the consequences. Are there... In a, we know that if you are a Black Lives Matter person, if you are Antifa, you're burning things down. We know that if you're a high-ranking Democrat politician raping little girls and going to Epstein Island, we know that there are no consequences for you. But will there be consequences for Democrats, uh, high, the, the entire political Democrat cult, for all of this thumbing their nose at Americans, right? In our, they don't seem to even care anymore that they're insulting, they're, they're, they're double-talking 60% of the American population. So they loathe us. They loathe and despise the concept of representative democracy. Um, they're biding their time, I think, until they can do away with the ability to give us a say in our government at all. But, you know, people say, well, surely they will change because after the midterms, when they get wiped out in the midterms, and I 100% believe they're going to get wiped out in the midterms. I think that is a foregone conclusion. I think the Republicans could go streaking in the quad and still win in a landslide in the midterms. Um, and so that then you have to ask the question, well, why doesn't it seem to be altering behavior? Because if you're interested in winning elections and the independents think you're insane and hate everything you've done, wouldn't you tack toward the center? Wouldn't you change the types of demands that you're making? And the answer is they they have one last shot to get as much done, to push as much beyond the, the out, outer, outer limit of the Overton window as they can, and they're going to take that shot. They will They will just simply then regroup to fight another day. It's what they did when the Democrats had 100% power when Barack Obama was president. They did as much as they could get away with, knowing they were going to lose elections, because you don't often have enough power to get big things done. And so you're going to see them try to accomplish as much as possible, whether it's universal basic income, whether it is a de facto amnesty for millions of people, whether it is fundamentally altering the rules on voting, whether it's obliterating the filibuster. They don't care if they lose. They'll win elections in the future. And so they have an eye to the long game. There, you know, there, there was a, a famous um, a speech that was given by the, uh, the general uh, in Vietnam after the United States pulled out of the war. And he essentially said, we knew we were going to win because the United States fights in five year, you know, in five year thought processes. You know, our wars last 100 years. So we knew we were going to outlast you guys because we were more tenacious and we were more dedicated and we were more determined. And that's the Democrats in the United States. They are more determined, they have a longer vision, and they are far more tenacious than we are. Well, and one wonders, even if you get a Repub- a, a likable and competent Republican in office, my experience with Republican governance, uh, Republican governance is that once you take power, you start from where you are. So if the, if the Democrats push things a thousand degrees left, that's just to do the normal, right? The, the, the idea that Republicans right. are gonna go in and root up all that stuff that was just passed and kill it, uh, I've not seen them do that very often. No, not not at the state level. You almost never see it. Uh, Trump did it as president in some in some meaningful ways. 
uh, in an executive capacity, but you are not going to see that happen. Maybe you'll see one or two nominal reforms. Maybe you would see some really substantial reforms. Remember when Scott Walker was elected, we did get the substantial reform of Act 10, and we didn't get much after that. You know, that was that was the one big reform tapping out. I'm done. That's and then the Republicans figured they did their hard thing. And so now they can tack back toward the center. Now they can go back to their bipartisan compromises. And by the way, bipartisan always means the ever greater ratchet to the left of policy and culture. Um, and so I'm, I'm not super optimistic either. DeSantis is a shining star. Um, if DeSantis becomes the presidential candidate, does he all of a sudden forget you know, forget the girl who brought him to the dance, which of course was pushing back, undoing bad things and embracing serious reform. It's that time again. It's time for some real education. Harrison Bergeron style. This is a great short story. We've been studying just little teasing glimpses of it all week long because I want you to read it. Hopefully just not give too much away. Try to pique your interest just a little bit. Kurt Vonnegut Jr. was a man of the left, but boy, did he write for lack of a better word, conservatively about certain issues. This is back in the 60s when to be a liberal meant you still loved your country, you wanted to see our borders protected, you believed in free speech before the left had morphed into this communist uh, conglomerate. So Bergeron and, and Kurt Vonnegut was, while he was a man of the left, he did He did agree with most Americans on some key issues, as traditional liberals used to. Harrison Bergeron is a fantastic short story that warns about the consequences of what we today would call equity, when everybody has to be the same all the time. Uh, I've only showed you a couple of clips uh, very sparingly. I'm going to do the same thing today, but a little bit more. Take a look at our first quote. We've got three quotes today from Harrison Bergeron. Here's now uh, one of the quotes. Play your best and I'll make you barons and dukes and earls. This is after Harrison Bergeron, who was born gifted, finally runs away. He escapes from the community with its radical equity policies. In other words, people who could sing really well had such stuff such stuff put into their mouths so they couldn't. People who could jump real high, like athletic people, were forced to wear weights to keep them more grounded so they weren't better than other people. Now, when Harrison, who is really quite brilliant, he's a borderline genius, when he runs away from this civilization, if you can call it that, because he wants freedom, he immediately starts uh, when he experiences freedom, carrying it too far. So for instance, he, be, he, he fashions himself a king, a king of this new world without equity. And he says, play your instruments as best as you can. Play your notes. Ba- ballet dancers, dance as best as you can. Not only will we not punishment, punish you for your achievements, we will reward you and promote you for being the best you can at what you do. Um, a beautiful motto for today. Take a look at the next quote. It became their obvious intention to kiss the ceiling. They kissed it, right? We're talking about these dancers, right, who no longer under the artificial weights placed on them, these ballet dancers who were uh, imitating heart and deer, uh, they're no longer under these weights that hold them down. Now they can leap, and they can leap as high as they possibly can. In fact, they were so free for the first time to be able, they were leaping higher than they had ever leaped before because of what happens when you let people be people and you remove these equity responsibilities. And take a look at one last quote from Harrison Bergeron. Glampers, the handicapper general, fired twice, and the emperor and the empress were dead. That's the end of our friend Harrison Bergeron. Glampers is the head handicapper. And I love that name, Glampers. It, it, It implies clamps, right? Holding people down. Glampers, the handicapper, capper, the handicapper general, shows up at the scene. Bergeron, who has ignored, anointed himself emperor, he and his lady are shot dead, and we go back to the world of repressive equity. Just a quick reminder that the best way to access our content is to download our Freedom Project media app. Simply search Freedom Project in your app store, and it's completely free to load the app. 
And when you do, you'll get access to 18 new videos a week, plus all of our award-winning lectures and animations. Now we want to take a moment to show some love to our Patriot Club members. Today, we give a shout out to Elaine from Hialeah, Florida. Thank you, Elaine, for all of your support. We appreciate it. And that's going to do it for this show. For Freedom Project, I'm Dr. Duke. Until next time, stay educated, my friends. Thank you.